Hello, Tanya Laird here, and welcome to part four of lecture nine of ENGR 231 Engineering Statics. In this portion of the lecture, I'm going to work through some examples of applying the method of joints to trusses. So, as we saw in part three, the basic method uh, or the basic steps in the method of joints will be to first isolate uh, every member in every joint in a truss by drawing an exploded view of the truss. Then we're going to apply equations of equilibrium to those joints and solve for all unknown member forces and reactions. So I'm going to work through a brief example here uh, just to get started. And I'm going to call this example one. So let's consider the following truss. And let's say you have a truss like this. And I'll start out with a nice, uh, basic, simply supported truss. So maybe something, oh, kind of like this. Pin joints, another pin joint here, and maybe something like this. And then, oh, maybe something, oh, what do I want to do? Maybe something like this, maybe a square in the middle, like this. And another pin joint here, or diagonal here. I just want to start out with a nice, simply supported truss to begin. And this here, and this here, then a diagonal here, and this is going to be a roller support. And then this is our pin support and our roller support, and all of the joints are pins. And I'm going to label these joints A, B, A and B, and then C, D, E, and F. They're not E again, F. And I'm going to go ahead and give us some dimensions. Oh, let's just say right here, uh, maybe this is, maybe the, each bay will have a height of eight feet and maybe a width of six feet, a width of six feet. So that'll make all of those diagonals a nice three, four, five. Mm, six feet, six feet, and six feet. Uh, six feet, six feet. Actually, you know what? Maybe I'll make things a little bit interesting and make that an eight foot. Uh, well, no, six feet. That's fine as well. And an eight foot, uh, another six foot here. Then I should show some loads on this. And I guess I'll just go ahead and put a single 10 kip load here. So I'll have a 10 kip load applied downward at joint B. So uh, we have all of our dimensions. We have all of the required things that we'll need to actually solve this truss. We have our dimensions, we have our loads, we have our joint names, uh, where, uh, how it's supported, and this is uh, statically determined. It's a nice simple truss, a true simple truss. So let's go ahead and work through this. So given, all the following is given, and then find uh, reaction forces and all, uh, maybe I should say all external reaction forces or external reaction and internal member forces. and internal member forces. So let's go ahead and do that. And uh, the first step is going to be, uh, well, what I'm going to do is something I discussed previously, and that is to first solve for the external reactions, uh, the reactions at C and F, by treating the entire truss as a single rigid body. So let's go ahead and do that. And what I mean by that when I say treating it as a single rigid body is by ignoring any kind of internal forces. And I'm going to ignore the fact that this is actually made of individual members and just treat this like a basic trapezoid. So I'm just going to say, okay, uh, forces will be transmitted through the truss and ignoring any kind of internal forces, the actual forces inside the members, I'm just going to look at what kind of external forces are needed to keep this thing in equilibrium. So you have a 10 kip force applied downward at joint B and then at joint C, uh, I'm going to have a CY and then some sort of CX here, some sort of CX. And then I'm going to have at joint F, some FY, some force at, at uh, joint F in the Y direction. Then I should, if I'm doing a free body diagram, I should probably go ahead and label the dimensions. This is going to be at the same six feet, six feet, six feet, and eight feet. 
Although, as we'll see for this particular case, the eight feet will not be important for this particular free ride diagram. Now, uh, let's go ahead and do a, uh, let's just go ahead and work through the equations of equilibrium. I'm going to do a sum of forces in the x direction, and that will be just cx. And there is no other force, so cx is just equal to zero. Then, I could do a summation of uh, forces in the y direction, but I really don't want to do that because I would have two unknowns in that equation. And as we'll see as we work through this truss, I'm going to try to avoid ever apply, ever get going through a, a case where I have uh, more than three unknowns on a given uh, on a given joint, or I'm going to try to avoid a case where I have two unknowns in one equation if I can. I can solve systems of equations if I need to, but I'd rather avoid doing that if I can. So I'm going to start by doing a balance of moments about joint C. And uh, at this point, Cx and Cy, neither of them will generate a moment there. And so I'm going to have uh, negative 10 kips, this force, this force here, and it's going to be clockwise, so that'll be a negative moment, and the moment arm length will be 12 feet. Then I'll have Fy plus Fy times a moment arm length of 18 feet. Moment arm length of 18 feet, this equals zero. And then uh, Fy is going to be equal to 10 kips uh, times 12 over 18, or uh, two thirds of 10, or um, let's see, two thirds of 10, so that's going to be 10 times two over three, or I could do that as 20 thirds, or I could just say that is 6.667 kips, if I'm willing to do this as an ugly decimal. Then, so we have our uh, first uh, non-zero reaction, our F uh, Y here. Then I'm going to have to I'm going to go ahead and do a summation of moments about joint F, and that'll allow me to get C Y. So summation of moments about joint F, I'll have C Y, which will be a negative moment, negative C Y times a moment arm length of six of 18 feet. That's just six times three, and then plus 10 kips times a moment arm length of six feet. And all of this is equal to zero. And then Cy will be equal to 10 kips times uh, eight, uh, six over three, uh, sorry, six over 18. And that will come to, that's one third. And so that will simply come to 3.333 kips. So we now have our reaction forces. So the next step is going to be to draw an exploded view of the truss. And before I do that, I'm just going to draw a really quick sketch in the upper left corner. And I'm going to then, I can then use this as a quick reference as I draw out my exploded view. So I have, this is the general form of my truss. And I have joints A, B, C, D, E, and F. And my forces are 10. Uh, 10 and 10, 3.33 and uh, 6.66. And then I'll go ahead and squiggle the dimensions in here. This is just for my own reference really, so I don't have to jump back and forth. It's uh, eight in the height and six in the width. So eight, six, six, and six. So uh, let me show you now what I mean by an exploded view. An exploded view is when I draw a series of free body diagrams, uh, labeling, basically isolating each joint and replacing each force or replacing each member with a set of forces. Now, what I'm gonna do, uh, which is what I discussed in part three briefly, is that I'm just gonna go ahead and assume uh, right off the bat that all of the forces are in tension. I know fundamentally this is not going to happen. Now, if you were really clever and were to d deliberately design a problem, you might actually be able to design one where the forces in every single member in a truss are positive. If you have just the right amount of the right type of external loads, it might actually be possible to design a truss so that all of the members are in tension. But that would be uh, that would be an interesting problem. But almost any real world truss, you're going to have some combination of tension and compression. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually let me. I like to actually put the joint names inside the uh, inside the joints. So A B, and then C. So I had to give myself a little more room there. Uh, C, D, uh, and then let me, I guess, let me put C a little bit, give myself a little more room. C will be over here as a triangle. Uh, B, over here is another circle. And then joint E. 
and then joint F. Now I'll go ahead and draw the external uh, forces. I'll have the load of 10 kips applied downward at joint B, 10 kips. Then I'll have a 3.33 kip force at joint C pointing upward and a 6.666 uh, kip force uh, pointing upward at joint F. Then I'm going to show all of the internal forces and these are all force pairs. So I have an FEF and I typically label these just uh, in terms of uh, just in terms of like I usually just use an F to designate a force and then subscripts designating the uh, what joints there between and typically I just put uh, at least when I'm doing trusses I just say okay well whatever force is the uh, whatever joint is the lowest letter in the alphabet that's the one I put that's the letter I pick first or the one I put first this is entirely arbitrary entirely uh, just a style choice I find that works a lot when I'm working through trusses it helps me keep track of things but you can do uh, what works best for you. So I'll have an FEF and an FEF. So I am drawing these with the members all in tension. FAC and FAC. So FAC and FAC, FCD and FCD. FAD and FAD. FBE in the vertical and FBE. Then the center here at the bottom center, FDE and FDE. Now, a common question I often get is uh, about these force arrows. See, I, st I, I am drawing this with the force, with, I, right now I mentioned that I'm drawing this with all the forces in tension, all the member forces in tension. Now, a common, a very, very common source of confusion is that you see our st people, students often see arrows pointing inward and they say, wait, wait a minute, that's force arrows, they're, they're going inward, that's clear compression. Well, that's actually not the case. Because if you think about this, I'm basically cutting uh, out the members and replacing the members with forces. So think about how equilibrium works. If I have a member in tension, that's how the member looks. There's going to be forces on the member going outward from the member. But on these diagrams, I'm not drawing the force direct. Uh, I'm not drawing the forces on the members. I'm drawing the forces on the joints. So if you imagine the forces on the joints, equal and opposite, Newton's third law. So uh, forces going away from the joints are tension, forces going toward the joints are compression. And I just have one other force I need to label, so just in case that was confusing there. Actually two forces, uh, FBF, uh, FBF, and FBF. I should probably put the force uh, triangles on there, the slope triangles. Uh, these are three, four, five triangles because six uh, divided by two is three and eight divided by two is four. So these are three, four, five. And I also have F, uh, the diagonal here, FBD to worry about. So FBD and FBD. And this is also, these are also three, four, five. Uh, three, four, and five, and this is also a three, four, five. Also a three, four, five. All right, so now um, what I'm going to do is just to work through a uh, work through each of these joints, applying equations of equilibrium. So I think I'm going to start with uh, joint C. So let's consider joint C. Look at this, I'm gonna look at just this joint here. And, and when we apply equations of equilibrium to one joint, we have the nice thing about isolating each joint is that I don't need to worry about all the other forces when I'm doing equilibrium on joint C. I only need to worry about joint C itself because I have cut it out and isolated just that joint. So I'm gonna do a, now, uh, as we discussed in part three of this lecture, 
we saw or that we uh, we I described how we treat joints as point particles. So I'm not going to be worried about any moments about joint C because we don't even have the dimensions of joint C. So we're, we're going to be looking at just the summation of forces in the x direction and just the summation of forces in the y direction. In other words, we're only looking at translational equilibrium. So the summation of forces in the x direction, actually, uh, that would be a poor choice to start. I think I would rather start with joint uh, the summation of forces in the y direction. And the reason for that is that uh, only one of the unknown forces has a y-directional component. So sum summation of forces in the y-direction, I'm going to have FAC, uh, FAC times 4 over 5, and then plus 3.33 kips is equal to 0. And if I solve for FAC, uh, FAC will then be negative 3.333 times 5 over 4. So 3.333 times 5 over 4, but negative. And I'm just going to go ahead and for now do these as ugly decimals. This is negative 4.167 kips. And this is going to be in compression. So we have our first member force. Then I'm going to do a summation of forces in the x direction. And this will give me, uh, let's see, uh, I will have FAC times uh, a ratio to get its horizontal component of 3 over 5. And then plus FCD, and this is equal to 0. And so FCD then, and you notice when I crafted the equation that I usually just craft them or write them as they appear in the original diagram, in the original drawing. I know that in actuality FCD would be going to the left because it's negative, but I just like to work through the equations uh, as they appear in the original diagram and then just apply a negative on the back end and actually substitute the force in. But you can do, again, what works best for you. I've seen it done different ways. So FCD then will equal negative FAC uh, times 3 over 5, which will equal negative FAC, uh, negative FAC, or actually I should put in the value there. Uh, negative, negative 4.167 times 3 over 5. And so 4.167 times negative 3 divided by 5, and this comes to exactly 2.5 kips. And this will be in tension. 2.5 kips in tension. All right, so where to go next? I think I'm going to go to joint uh, F. Now, I am going to try to cram all this on one page so that I can avoid drawing a bunch of smaller diagrams and things like that, and so you can easily see where all these numbers are coming from. So I'm going to go to joint F now. And the reason I'm doing that is that I usually don't start on one end of, one end of the truss and just go you know, from one end to the other. Often I jump around uh, just looking for whatever uh, member tends to be simplest at the time. And so uh, joint F, the nice thing about this is I have only two unknowns. It's very similar to this one. Two unknowns, and only one of them has a component in the y direction. So joint F here, I'll do a summation of forces in the y direction. And that will be FBF times uh, 4 over 5, and then um, plus 6.666, uh, 666 equals 0 which means that FBF is equal to negative, uh, so that's going to be negative 6.666 times 5 over 4, and this will come to negative 8.333 kips, which will be in compression. So you have our second member force, and then a summation of forces in the x direction. A summation of forces in the x direction uh, on joint F still, will give us, let's see, and again, I'm going to ignore the fact that I know FBF would actually be downward and to the right, so actually positive in the x direction, and just apply a negative. So negative FBF uh, times 3 over 5 to get the x component, just applying the ratio method, uh, minus FEF, and this then equals 0. And so uh, FEF equals uh, negative, that's going to e equal negative, uh, negative 8.33 times 3 over 5. 
And that will come then uh, to a positive, so 8.333 times 3 over 5. Uh, negative 3 over 5 there. And that comes to exactly 5 kips, which is intention. So FEF is 5 kips intention. So, uh, so we have that, we now have our fourth unknown number force. So I'm just going to kind of cordon that off. So uh, we have uh, this one. Basically, we have this one. We have this one. We have this one. We have this one. So uh, where to go next? I think the easiest place to go, the most, the, the best place to go right now, well, A and E are both very promising. So I'm going to go to joint E. And this is this one is actually going to demonstrate something that we call, that we will later call a zero force member, but I'm going to save that for a different portion of a lecture. We'll actually have a short video discussing zero force members because they're kind of neat. So joint E, well we have FEF which is equal to five kips. So what I'm going to what I'm going to do is a simple summation of forces in the y direction uh, that will be equal to FBE, uh, and there's nothing else. FDE and FEF, member DE and member EF, are both purely horizontal. Neither of those forces has any vertical component, so it'll just be FBE equals zero. And just FBE equals zero, that's it. Then, summation of forces in the X direction. Uh, this will be negative FDE plus FEF is equal to zero. Uh, plus FEF is equal to zero, which means FDE is equal to FEF. Or FEF, not EF there. FEF. Uh, which means that FDE, uh, FDE is simply equal to that same 5 kip tension force. Uh, 5 kips in tension. All right, so we have that. Let's go ahead and cordon off joint E's work. So we now have this one, this one, this one, and this one, although these are just two sides of the same member, of course. Uh, let's see, what else could we do? I think I might next do joint A, because that one's a relatively nice one to work through. Joint A. I'm gonna next do a summation of forces in the Y direction. And the reason for that is that uh, if I do in the x direction, well, actually, you know what? In this particular case, either one is just as good. Um, this one is purely in the y, this one's purely in the x. So either one of those would have only an x, or uh, would have uh, either one of those equations would have only a single unknown. So actually, either one is perfectly valid. Either one's perfectly fine. So let's just do summation of forces in the x direction first. I will have FAC, actually negative FAC, times uh, 3 over 5. Negative FAC times 3 over 5 plus FEF is equal to 0. And uh, that leads to, it's not 5, looks like a 6. And that leads to FEF being equal to simply uh, 3 over 5 times FAC. Uh, 3 over 5 times FAC, and that means that FEF is 3 fifths of FAC, which is the negative 4.167. Uh, and then that comes to, so let's get that negative 4.167 and multiply by 3 over 5. And multiply by 3 over 5. And that comes to exactly negative 2.5 kips. And it's negative, so that will be in compression. Negative 2.5 kips, and that will be in compression. Uh, so now we have that force and that force. And now let's go ahead and get FAD by doing a summation of forces on the y direction uh, for joint A. Summation of forces in the y direction. I will have negative FAC uh, times 4 over 5, and then minus FAD. And this is equal to 0. And so uh, FAD there, if I, if I move everything to the other side, I get that FAD 
is equal to negative uh, FAC times 4 over 5. Or that's equal to negative uh, negative 4.167 Uh, negative 4.167 uh, kips, of course, times 4 fifths. So this is actually going to turn out to be positive. And that makes sense uh, because this one is, uh, this one's negative here, so it becomes positive. So this needs to be positive to balance that out because that will be a positive minus a positive, and that will come to zero. So 4.167 uh, times 4 over 5. And this comes to oh, if I can keep if I can keep, if I can quit from uh, or keep from jumping ahead, that will come to three point three 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 kips, uh, which will be in tension. So we now have FAD, and we also have FEF there. So we now have this one and this one, and finally, all that remains is FBD. And to do that, I think I'm going to look at and my remaining space is very oddly shaped to say the least, but I think to do that I'm going to apply equilibrium on joint uh, D, and the easiest way to do that will be a uh, summation of forces in the y direction on joint D. So a summation of forces uh, on, in the y direction, and I'll have FAD, FAD, and then plus FBD uh, times 4 over 5 for the y component, which means that FBD, uh, if you solve, oh, of course this has to equal 0, let me uh, complete the equation, and if I solve that for, uh, that equals 0, if I solve that for FBD, I get that FBD is equal uh, to negative FAB times 5 over 4, negative FAD times 5 over 4 times 5 over 4. Or in other words, uh, FBD is equal to uh, negative 3.333 kips uh, times 5 over 4. And this will then come to uh, negative 4.167 kips. That thing just keeps wanting to jump ahead. Uh, negative 4.167 kips. Sorry, my tablet's having some issues tonight. Okay, uh, negative 4.167 kips, which is in compression. All right, and that is the basic method of the uh, that is the basic process for the method of joints. So again, we can see that the basic process is to first, uh, if we have the right number of external reactions, like uh, it's especially good if you have only three external reactions. Uh, because then the entire thing is, as a single rigid body is statically determinant. If you have more than three, then you really don't want to bother doing the um, treating the whole thing as a single rigid body and solving for external reactions, although in certain cases that can be useful. Um, so we get our external reactions first if we can, then we draw an exploded view of the truss labeling all of the forces, including their, uh, including their slope lines for any kind of um, uh, for any uh, diagonal members, and this is the uh, one thing that if you are do you still using sines and cosines by this stage in statics, uh, if you're using sines and cosines for truss members like this, when you already have the dim the dimensions, you're doing something extremely wrong. You really don't want to be doing that by this stage. Um, by this stage of the game, you really should be multiplying by force ratios, uh, simply because finding thetas, as we've looked at this before. Finding thetas and then taking the cosine of that, when you've already taken the inverse cosine of that, it there is no point. If you already have the ratios, you don't need to do that. To get the x component of this, I don't need to take the, I don't need to find the theta based on the inverse uh, tangent of four and three, uh, of four over three, and then take the cosine. I don't, I don't then get FAC by multiplying FAC by the cosine of that theta. That's pointless. Uh, rather, and much much faster. You can simply take FAC and multiply it to get the x component, for example, by 3 over 5. That's just simple, simple, trivially simple um, proportional triangles, just literally basic geometry. Uh, applied to vectors, of course. But uh, anyway, with that aside, this is the basic method for the method of joints, the basic process for the method of joints. We uh, go and uh, 
uh, first uh, figure out what kind of things we're looking for. We're looking for all, often we're looking for all member forces and all external reactions. We find them at the external forces if we can by treating the truss as a single rigid body. And then we go and break the truss into pieces, replacing all members with forces, often initially assuming uh, tension, with, where tension is uh, forces pointing away from the joints. And then we apply uh, static equilibrium, but in particular static point particle equilibrium to each joint to solve for all of our member forces. And we don't necessarily move uh, from left to right, rather we tend to move uh, from joint to joint wherever we see uh, easy pickings or easy points on the board, like you sometimes might say. And uh, except if you're using a matrix method, you can also use this uh, using a matrix method like an Excel or something like that, but that may be sometimes a bit beyond the scope of this course. And that is, uh, I think that will uh, finish up example one with a brief introduction, uh, and that it will serve as a brief introduction uh, to uh, the method of joints. All right, so for example two, I want to look at a kind of truss that is not a simple truss. So as we recalled previously, a simple truss is one that can be formed by simply starting with a triangle truss and then adding uh, repeated elements of uh, repeated elements of uh, uh, an additional um, joint and two members in turn, basically adding triangle after triangle after triangle. So I have another one that I want to work through, and it's going to be something different something that we haven't really seen before. And in fact, this is actually going to be a truss that even lacks uh, internal geometric stability. So a little bit different type of truss. It's not going to be a simple truss, but it's still going to be statically determinant. So I'm going to have a truss like this. And this truss is going to rely on its uh, supports for stability rather than internal geometry. So I'm going to have, uh, let's say I have a pin joint here. So I'm also going to have a truss on a wall to be a little different. So I'll have a vertical uh, section here, or a vertical surface, I should say. And I'll try to keep the truss relatively simple. Uh, something like this. And I think I'll just have a, uh, mm, let's see. How do I want to do this? Um, Maybe something like this. With pin joints here and here, and just like this. But notice, I'm not going to put a member here. And when I say this is not geometrically stable or internally geometrically stable, if I were to remove this truss from its pins or from its supports here, what would happen? Well, this member here, the bottom uh, member here, that would just be flopping around. It would not be secured down at all. Now, the main body of the truss would still maintain co uh, uh, cohesion, but it would not maintain its shape. So, uh, and let's go ahead and put a couple loads on this. Oh, let's see. <clears throat> Maybe I'll put a... Um, let's see. Since I did uh, English units in, in the previous one, maybe I'll do metric in this one. So maybe I'll put a 10 kilonewton load here, and just for fun, uh, for relative definitions of fun, uh, we could put a 5 kilonewton load here. And uh, for dimensions, uh, let's see, let's give this some interesting dimensions. Let's just say, oh, I don't know. Let's say this is, I'm not going to try to do a four, five, four, three, five triangle or anything like that. Let's just say this is 10 feet and this is 8 feet then. Oh, sorry. I don't want to, I, I said I, did, I was going to do this in uh, metric. So um, let's say this is 3 meters and uh, this is 2 meters. Okay. So, reasonably metric problem. Okay, so we got our kilonewtons, we have our meters, we are in metric. Good, done. Okay, so let's go ahead and work through this now. Uh, first, I would like to check to make sure this is statically determinate. So, uh, first I'd like to label uh, the, well, also I should probably label the joints A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D. Uh, so relatively straightforward, and then given all of this is given, and then find uh, the reactions and forces in all members. The external reactions and all member forces.
and all member forces. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's see here. How might we do this? Well, let's take a look. So um, let's consider this for a moment. Let's look at the external. I would like to just go ahead and label the external forces. We're going to have two forces here and two forces here. So we'll have an AY and an AX and a CY and a CX. Now I would like to I would like to double check that this thing is statically determinate. So let's try the m plus r equals 2j equation. m, 1, 2, 3, 4, there are four members. So again, m plus r, uh, to be fully statically determinate, must be m, it, we must have m plus r equals 2j. It equals 2j. m in this case equals 4. The number of reactions equals 4. And the number of joints is equal to 4. So 2 times 4, 8 equals 8. We are indeed statically determinate. We are indeed statically determinate. Now, but again, as I mentioned previously, we are not going to be able to solve for all of these uh, member forces, or sorry, not member forces, these external reactions, by treating this as a single rigid body. If I isolate this and treat it as a, just a simple rectangle, for example, I now have uh, th four unknowns, but only three equations of equilibrium. However, even though I can't solve for all of them, it may still sometimes be beneficial uh, to do that. So, you know what, I think I actually will go ahead and do that. I think I'll go ahead and solve for as many of the reactions as I can, and then um, we'll see what kind of benefit that gives us. So I'm going to start by uh, drawing out the truss as a single rigid body. And yes, I know there is actually no uh, member in the uh, between A and C, but that's fine because again, I'm just drawing it as a single rigid body, ignoring the fact that there are intermediate members, that kind of thing. I'm just analyzing it in terms of the forces that are on that single region. So we have a 10 uh, kilonewton force here. I guess I use the same force, uh, 10 kips to, uh, well, not the same force, but I guess I use the same uh, number. Oh well, it shouldn't really matter. Uh, 10 kilonewtons and 5 kilonewtons. And then I'll have CX and, uh, oh, not sorry, not there, AX and I'll have CX. Then I'll have a CY and AY. So by some clever balance of moments, I, I will be able to solve for some of these, but not all of these. So let's start by doing a balance of moments about point C, or actually by about point A, why not? Sum of moments about point A. And the nice thing about this is that this force, uh, the CY and the two A forces, neither of them will generate a moment about that point. And so I have, oh, and this is two meters and three meters. Some of them, it's about A. Uh, I will have just the only unknown force will be CX. Again, the only unknown force will be CX uh, in this equation. And its moment arm is going to be two meters. Uh, two meters. And it's going to be a positive moment because that moment is counterclockwise. Then I will have a negative moment by the 10 kilonewton force. So minus 10 kilonewtons times a moment arm length of 3 meters. And then I'll have the 5 kilonewton force, which will produce a positive moment about point A, so plus 5 kilonewtons, and this will be times a moment arm length of 2 meters. And all of this will equal 0 because it's in static equilibrium. Uh, again, 5 kilonewtons times 2 meters, uh, positive. And so uh, Cx times 2 meters then is equal to well, uh, let's see, this is equal to 30 uh, kilonewton meters uh, minus 10 kilonewton meters. Uh, 10 kilonewton meters. If I multiply everything there correctly and bring it over to the other side. Uh, so that comes to 20 kilonewton meters, which is Cx times 2 meters, which means then that Cx is simply equal uh, to 10 uh, kilonewtons. The meters will cancel out. And 10 kilonewtons, and this will be to the right. 10 kilonewtons to the right. Uh, next, I want to do a summation of moments about joint A, or sorry, about joint C. And this will do a similar thing. 
where a uh, where um, a y c x and c y none of them will generate a moment about that point. None of them will generate a moment about that point. So uh, let's look at this. If I do a, a, a summation of moments there, what will I have? Well, um, so the only unknown force will be ax, and that will generate a negative moment. Negative ax times a moment arm length of two meters. Then minus 10 kilonewtons, minus because it is a, a clockwise or a negative moment, times three meters, and then the five kilonewtons, uh, well, actually, on joint C here, the 5 kilonewton force will not generate any moment whatsoever. And all of this is equal to zero. And then AX will be equal to, well, this is going to be positive when I bring it to the right, but then it will be negative. So this is going to be 30 over 2, or simply uh, negative 15 kilonewtons. Negative 15 kilonewtons. And what I would like to do is just a basic sum of forces in the x direction to check my work. And that is going to be, based on this drawing here, AX plus CX uh, plus 5 kilonewtons equals 0. And this is, let's see, AX is negative 15. Uh, CX is plus 10. And then, then I have the plus 5. Negative 15 plus 10 plus 5 indeed equals 0. 0 equals 0, so we do have our right reaction forces. Now, this is all we can get in terms of reaction forces from the external uh, from external equilibrium alone, or external, uh, this is, these are the only external forces we can get by treating the entire object as a single rigid body, is what I probably should say. Again, uh, because if you think about this, the CY, if I try to take the moment about, say, point B, well, then I'm not going to get any um, anything meaningful from that. I'm just going to get a, uh, both of these will generate a moment there. And if I do a summation of forces in the y direction, again, I just, I'm not going to be able to solve for all of the forces. I fundamentally have too many unknowns for just the, uh, to solve for the external forces directly. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to move on to doing the joint by joint approach, but that's still, that, that doesn't mean I shouldn't have done the step. This is still very useful because I got two forces and those are going to make uh, my life a lot simpler when I work through the equations of equilibrium. Okay. So I'm going to sort of redraw this here. Um, I'm just going to redraw it. I'm going to ignore the uh, circular joints here. I just ignore the joints as uh, in, in general. I'm not going to bother drawing the joints. This is just going to be a quick sketch showing what I know and what I don't know. Uh, so I have a uh, AX, which is to the uh, left of 15 kilonewtons. I'm going to go ahead and reverse this one. 15 kilonewtons. I have a CX of 5 kilonewtons to the right. And this is one case where I don't mind reversing the arrows uh, in a case where I'm already redrawing my diagrams. And th at that time, it, sometimes it can make sense uh, if you wish to redraw or change the direction of the arrows. And then this is 5 kilonewtons. So I have a 5 kilonewton force here and a 10 kilonewton force here. And then I should probably, uh, I should label all my joints and dimensions on this little sketch. A, B, C, and D. And the dimensions are uh, 2 meters and 3 meters. 2 meters and 3 meters. And then I do have the unknown uh, Y reactions as well that I haven't solved for yet. The uh, C, uh, the, or sorry, the AY there. And the CY. Now I'm going to go back and draw my big exploded view. So I'll have my, uh, let's see, I like to draw it like this. Clearly showing that it is a, a pin joint or a pin support, at, at, uh, more specifically. And then the pin support C. And then a pin joint B. And a pin joint D. Then I'll show the external reactions, or sorry, the external forces. Uh, 10 kilonewtons downward, and then to the right, uh, 5 kilonewtons. Then here, I have 5 kilonewtons to the right, and 15 kilonewtons to the left. 15 kilonewtons to the left. 
And then in terms of internal forces, I'm not going to have any, one, any force going from A to C because there is no member there. But I'll have forces in every other direction, basically. I'll have uh, FAB, the fabulous force, uh, and then uh, the, then equal and opposite in the other direction, FAB. Again, remembering that I'm assuming everything's in tension, and that tension represent, is represented by forces going away from the joints, as we discussed in example one. And then uh, FCD like this, also horizontal, and FCD, like so, equal and opposite. Then I'll have an FBD, and an FBD. And then finally, I'll have a force that is just another fad, just coming and going, just here and there, blowing in the breeze, FAD. Another stupid joke. It's okay, I make it every year. Anyway, <laughs> FAD here. And I probably should, whenever you have a diagonal, you should show the uh, force triangle, or this, uh, uh, or the force slopes, whatever you want to refer to this as, uh, and I can just call this a three, two, and so if I take this, this is not going to be an even number, but that would just be the square root of three squared plus two squared, or the square root of thirteen. Oh, and I cannot forget my other reactions that I still haven't solved for yet, and that is going to be a y and c y, a y and c y. A, Y, and C, Y. All right, so where do we begin with this mess? Well, we can begin at really any point we like, but um, let's see. I'm seeing uh, some nice beginning points at a couple places. Uh, let's see. I think this joint and this joint would be good places to start. And fundamentally, the reason for that is that those will allow me to get some uh, forces really quickly. So let's consider joint B. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is a summation of forces in the x-direction. Summation of forces in the x direction, and uh, I just have negative FAB, uh, and that's it. The down, the ten kip force is downward, and FBD is also purely downward or purely upward if it's a negative, if it's compression. But regardless, it's purely in the y direction, and so this just equals zero. And so FAB is a zero force member, which we'll discuss more, which we'll discuss later when we look at uh, zero force members, I think at the start of lecture uh, 10 tomorrow. Uh, FAB here, so FAB is equal to zero. So we have this one and this one. Uh, and that's all we can get from, well, no, we actually, I guess we can get FBD as well. Uh, summation of forces uh, in the y direction now, I will have negative 10 kilonewtons, uh, negative 10 kilonewtons, and then minus FBD, is equal to zero. And therefore, uh, FBD is going to be equal and opposite to that. And so FBD will be equal to negative 10 kilonewtons, which is compression. Negative 10 kilonewtons in compression. So now we have this one and this one. So I'll just go ahead and block this off. Okay, so where should we go next? Uh, I think joint D might be a good choice. And actually, that will allow that will get us the last member forces. So joint D here. Uh, joint D. Uh, joint D. I'm going to start by doing a summation of forces in the y direction. Summation of forces in the y direction. I'm going to have FAB or FAD, sorry. And then to get the y component, I'll multiply by two over root thirteen. Two over root thirteen and then plus FBD. Uh, plus FBD is equal to zero, and FAD is then equal to negative uh, FBD times root 13 over two, times root 13 over two, which is then equal to, or FAD is then equal to, uh, negative, negative 10, Uh, negative, negative 10, and these are still uh, nice even numbers, so I think I might actually do this in exact form, uh, times root 13 over 2. So that will actually come to just a nice, simple uh, 5 root 13 positive kilonewtons. 
which will be intention. Nope, I don't want that. Well, let me clean that up a bit. Uh, 5 root 13 kilonewtons, which is intention. All right, and that concludes. Uh, well, I guess no, we still have another one. I shouldn't corn that off yet. Sorry about that. Uh, then I can do a summation still on joint D. I can do a summation of forces in the x direction. Uh, so now I have this uh, FAD here. But in the in the x direction, then I'll have negative FAD uh, times three over root thirteen. and then minus FCD, and then plus five. And all of this is equal to zero. Then I'll have negative uh, times five over, uh, uh, five times root 13, uh, times three over root 13. Uh, and then minus FCD uh, plus five equals zero. And the root 13s will cancel out so I'll have negative 15 uh, minus FCD uh, plus 5 is equal to 0. And so that will then be uh, negative FCD, uh, then minus 10 equals 0, which means FCD, uh, FCD uh, from here to here is equal to negative 10 kips, or sorry, negative 10 kilonewtons, not kips, but kilonewtons, uh, which will be in compression negative 10 kilonewtons in compression. So we have that one and then that one. So all that's left, or we now have all of our member forces, all that remains is to apply equilibrium to some joints and to get our uh, member for or our uh, remaining reaction forces. So then on joint A, uh, what we're missing is the force in the y direction. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do a summation of forces in the y direction. I will have a y here, and then minus f a d uh, times uh, two over root thirteen, and all of this equals zero. And a y then, oh, if I can, my mouse wants to jump ahead right now. A y is equal to f a d times two over root thirteen or FAD here is equal to five root 13. So it's, and that's positive, five root 13 uh, times two over root 13. Root 13s cancel out and we get 10 uh, kilonewtons positive, uh, which will be, uh, well, in this case, it's not really tension or compression, it's a reaction force. So AY is um, 10 kilonewtons upward, a 10 kilonewton upward force. Then, uh, so I can, that's all I need from joint A. And then I can go finally to joint C. Uh, joint C here, and that will be my final equation of equilibrium. And I'm going to apply a, uh, well, let's see. Actually, uh, I can look at this and say, oh, I can just do a summation of forces in the uh, y direction. Actually, I could have gotten that just right off the bat. That would have been a good choice actually, but oh well, that's fine. Uh, summation of forces in the y direction. I'll just have CY and then nothing. So CY is just equal to zero. In fact, uh, the only two forces that are transmitted through joint C are, horizon are purely horizontal. So even though this joint has a capacity to carry vertical load, in fact, under the loadings that this trusser is experiencing, it's not carrying any vertical load. So if I put vertical load maybe on this joint or maybe on this joint, then maybe it would carry some sort of uh, vertical load, but actually probably not on this one. I'd have to apply it directly to joint C to get it to carry vertical load, but it can. And so it, does, it doesn't, uh, it's not currently doing so, but it does have the capacity to do so. All right, and I think through those two examples, we have described pretty well uh, the method of uh, joints uh, to solving basic trusses. So. The uh, approach is going to be the same for all of these cases. Basically, you start by solving for whatever external reactions you can by treating the truss as a single rigid body. Then you go and break the, then you draw the truss's exploded view and uh, label any in internal forces. Then work through uh, point particle equilibrium on every one of the, jo uh, every one of the uh, joints until you can get the uh, desired forces that you're looking for. All right, I think that'll do it for this portion of the lecture. And actually, I think that'll do it for lecture uh, nine altogether. 
In lecture 10, we're going to uh, do a quick uh, discussion of the um, the concept of zero force members, and then we're going to get into the meat and potatoes uh, of the main lecture, which will be uh, trusses of the method of sections. All right, so I think that'll do it for this portion of the lecture. Let me know if you have any. Um, let me know if you have any questions. And actually, this will do it for the, this will be the final portion of the entire lecture. So I hope you found this enjoyable. Hope you've learned a few things. Hope you found this interesting, at least, or at least not too so boring that it put you to sleep. Again, let me know if you have any questions. I will see you uh, later in, in lecture ten. And as always, uh, thank you.